Jim, can you hear me? I think I've got to reach this microphone as tall as the guys. Do some bit of duckage work to make this thing work. We will uh, begin. Sorry, we are a bit behind time, so my apologies um, if this runs slightly over, but uh, we'll do our best to be out of here by six o'clock. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Nathan Bolton, and I will be your MC for this evening for the City of Playford's. Um, Mental Health and Wellbeing Forum called Start the Conversation. Before we begin, we'll just start with a little bit of housekeeping. Mobile phones, if we could uh, please turn your mobile phones onto silent or off, that would be great for one whole conference, not to have a mobile phone go off. So thank you very much. Toilets, if you're not aware where the toilets are just yet, the toilets are if you go back out where you came in. Go across the, the hall in the front and you'll see the big sign on the far right hand side for the toilets down the, the hallway. In case of emergency, uh, we will follow one of the City of Playford staff members to the assembly point which is, will be going outside the front door um, and uh, meet in the area just at the front there in the, near the plaza. COVID restrictions, as you can see, we are still abiding. We do have COVID restrictions, hence why our seats are spaced out the way they are, so we can still maintain a level of physical distancing. That would be much appreciated. Um, you also have goodie bags on your seats. Feel free to look through theirs. There's um, information on services to support you in your local area. Some biscuits and some refreshments, drinks, cheese, and some crackers what I've been informed, so please feel free to either gnaw on them throughout the uh, presentation or wait, there will be a break about just over halfway through. And that break will be about 20 minutes. So, uh, so to kick things off, I'd also like to thank uh, the primary fund funding for today's event, who made today all happen, which is the Northern Communities Health Foundation, uh, who constantly strive to improve the lives of those living in the Northern District. A um, couple points to consider before we get started. Today we will be discussing sensitive topics, which can trigger you. I am well aware of the possibility of that happening. I have been in a conference where it's happened to me myself, so there's no shame. If you do need to stand up and leave the walkout, please do so. We also have the wonderful team from Skylight up in the little patios on either side, or just on the right-hand side there. She's waving just at the moment, I can just see. If you do need to sit down and have a conversation with someone, please just reach out to them, just ask, and um, hopefully we can you can leave here today better off and not in a lesser state of repair. Uh, today will also be recorded, so for us and all the presenters, just so you know, we have to stay relatively close to this area, uh, the camera, uh, and the video of this entire, um, for the, this forum will be up, made available on the City of Playford website in the coming week, so uh, feel free to join there or pass that information on to friends or colleagues who wish they could have been here today. So, before I invite uh, Robert Taylor um, onto the stage here to do our Welcome to Country, I would also like to acknowledge the lands that we meet on today are those of the traditional lands of the Ghana people, and I want to acknowledge their leaders or their elders post um, past, present and future. So to perform our Welcome to Country, can I please welcome up Robert Taylor. Thank you Nathan. Nyanki na miena, na mani, mani na budni, nyano kriyata, gani yata. Nyanyari Robert Kari Karabro Taylor. Nyanyari Naranga Kumagana miena. My little tongue began a mena. Kumanel Pania Tanga and Brandy. Tamda Lokopiana, Borkana, Kumagana Miniata. Nayakandaria, Numundaria, Natalia. Ladies and gentlemen, are you good? Yes. Yeah? That's good. I like to, I'll try to listen. 
asked anybody after the sermon. I can't remember. <laughs> Did you understand what I just said to you? No. A little bit, maybe, no? no? Well, the language I just spoke was the language of the Ghana people. Of course, this place here being the traditional lands of the Ghana people. My name is Robert Taylor. I represent three different Aboriginal groups. The Nanadiri from down on the Kurong, the Naranga from the York Peninsula, and the Ghana from here on the Adelaide Plains. And on behalf of my Ghana elders and ancestors, I'd like to welcome you all here today and acknowledge that this is the traditional land of the Ghana people. I'd also ask that we all respect the land and respect the, the Ghana people as the Ghana people have respected this country for many years before us. Of course, today's a special occasion. It's a difficult topic to talk about mental health and well-being, but it's certainly a discussion that needs to be had, as tough one as it is. Uh, so it's great that you've invited us out here today and great that you're all here today to, uh, for this cause. I'd like to sing a blessing song now. Traditionally, when we dance, we stomp our feet into the ground because we believe there's spirits everywhere, in the trees, in the wind, in the water, all around us, good spirits, bad spirits. So what we want to do is I've got to sing a song and we're going to call upon the good spirits of our ancestors to come here and join us today to make this a special occasion for all of us. This one here is the Kupiara song, one for the ancestors. Today, we're all here because we want to start a conversation. A conversation that should have found its roots among society and the people a long time ago, but has only come to the forefront of mainstream in recent years. Still at play and still at large lives a stigma surrounding mental health. A stigma surrounding the very nature of what it means to actually be human. A stigma surrounding what it means to live, to fall, to learn, to struggle, to make mistakes and to pick ourselves back up. For so long, we have suppressed our very right to move on from our darkest times and live a full and satisfying life on the belief that speaking about our pain and speaking about our struggles and our obstacles is nothing more than a sign of weakness and fragility of ourselves. But also with many of us holding the view that society will some way look down upon us and we will be discriminated against, stereotyped and misunderstood. Apparently, we are the broken ones for we are the ones willing to openly admit to ourselves and others that we have basked in some dark days in our lives and they have impacted us. However, each and every one of us in this room knows differently and knows that it takes more courage, more guts and more strength of character to put your hand up and say, today I am not Today, I 
am struggling. And today, I need some help. The hardest thing we will ever do is critically evaluate ourselves on the highest of levels and acknowledge and accept within that something isn't right. I have often said and wholeheartedly believe that it took more courage for me to stand up and face my demons than it ever took to stand firm on the battlefield. Jeez, for the things that I could tell myself, they have scared me more than any atrocity that I have endured. Today, we are here to start a conversation. We are the ones on the front line. We are the ones bringing mental health out of the shadows and therefore we are the ones that need to stop the stigma dead in this tracks. And we shall do this not through anger, frustration or patronisation, but through understanding, education and guidance. We are all here united under one goal, one future and one idea. And that is for everyone to live a mentally healthy and fulfilling life and to ensure that everyone knows that asking for help is in fact okay. To kick things off, I'd like to welcome uh, the Mayor of the City of Playford to the stage to say a few words. So if you wouldn't mind putting your hands together, please welcome <laughs> Mayor Glenn Crawford. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Playford Civic Centre. It's an absolute honour, privilege to be here today and to welcome each and every one of you to start the conversation, the Mental Health and Wellbeing Forum here in the City of Plaifen. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the land of the Ghana people and we respect their spiritual relationship with their country and to Elders past and present, we acknowledge those and to Robert for your wonderful welcome to country. It's always great to have you here. It's been a long time since we've seen you, but uh, you're a great friend of Plaifen. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a number of people I'd like to acknowledge today. And firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Honourable John Dawkins, NLC, the President of the Legislative Council of the South Australian Parliament, and the first Premier's Advocate for Suicide Prevention in South Australia. Uh, John, you've been a great friend for suicide prevention and mental health uh, strategies here in South Australia and also to the northern suburbs of Adelaide. And we want to welcome you here today and thank you for your ongoing support and commitment. I want to give you a special round of applause for all your great work that you've done. And of course, behind every great man and even greater woman, his wonderful wife, Sheila's here as well, so you shouldn't forget that. <laughs> uh, to Professor Gregory Crawford from the Northern Communities of Health Foundation, the Forum's funding body. Uh, Professor Crawford is another long-term supporter and friend of the City of Plath and does some great work out of the Lyle McEwen and uh, to you and your team to helping to fund something like this today is a great testament to your commitment to improving the lives of all people in the northern suburbs and to break in that stigma of mental health. So it's great to have you here, Professor Crawford. To elected members of the City of Playford, to Councillor Small and Smith, uh, to Mr Dave from Bolton, uh, we want to thank you for your uh, guest speaking that we'll do shortly and also to the wonderful service you've given our nation in defending our rights, liberties and values. So thank you very much for what you've done uh, to protect the way of life here in Australia. So thank you for that. To our other guest speakers, our storeholders, volunteers from Skylight and our community members, today is an opportunity for us to get together. And it's great to do so face to face because what a year it's been. A challenging year for all of us and where we've had to have great resilience to cope with the isolation, challenging circumstances and the concerns for our health of not just ourselves but our family and future in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's now, more than ever, more important that we continue to look after our own and others' mental health and wellbeing, and forums like these help to start the conversation. As a healthcare professional myself, I truly value the importance of building positive mental health relationships and the resilience that we have from our stakeholders, our family, friends and neighbours, and those that do their very best in helping to break down the stigma of mental health in this country. It's no surprise to anybody in this great hall today 
that almost one in two Australians will experience a mental health condition in their lifetime. Despite mental health prevalence, mental illness related stigma in our community still exists. But today, like the days before us and the many days ahead of us, we as a community together will start that conversation and break those stigmas and stereotypes. A conversation that identifies the stigma, culture, influence and barriers to help seek relationship to mental health is important that we break those down and to recognise that if you're not okay, or you know someone in your family or wider community network that isn't okay, it's important to reach out, to assist those that need to receive some support, care and guidance, and to work towards the health that they deserve to have like every Australian. So today, if you need some encouragement, feel free to ask for some help. Seek some guidance from friends, neighbours, support and community organisations today because we want to see everyone be okay. We would like those in the community today that aren't feeling okay to leave us some strategies and support and opportunities to know where to get some help and assistance but also to understand that you're not alone and that together we can start the conversation but more importantly we can be here to be a support and assist you in what you need. As a community, it is our each and every person's endeavour to break the cycle and reduce the harm and stigma caused by people affected by mental illness in our community. So events like these today really do help to facilitate and start the conversation by encouraging people to seek health, reducing social isolation, creating a welcoming and informative way to talk about mental health in our community, sharing positive experiences of recovery but also each and every one of you have a voice and by being here and showing your physical commitment today of being in this hall is a great way for us to continue and start those conversations in our community. Wellbeing is important and we value that here in the city of Playford because we need to look after ourselves, our loved ones, our mates and our wider community. But as we did hear earlier from Nathan that if we are struggling and any of our sessions today do cover some very sensitive topics, if any of this does cause any trigger of memories for you uh, of any past trauma, please, if you need to leave, do so, but grab, grab a, a hand of help from Skylark Mental Health Team and volunteers that are here today to assist you, because we do want you to be part of this forum as much as you can and want to be involved. Lastly, I'd like to acknowledge that without the funding received by the Northern Communities Health Foundation, forums like, like these wouldn't be possible. So I really think it's a hold on us to give a big round of applause to the Northern Communities Health Foundation their wonderful financial commitment <laughs> And without that commitment, and without the wonderful groups, whether it's Skylight, Ferris Care, uh, near me, the Office of the Premier's Advocate for Suicide Prevention and Community Resilience, the Playford Suicide Prevention Network, Job Prospects, the Northern Adelaide Local Health Network in the City of Playford, who are many of the stallholders here today who are providing services. So in our break, we're going to pop out there and get some information and say hi. Without you here today providing that support and assistance, then we wouldn't be having the forum as well. So I really want to thank you. The City of Playford values health and wellbeing and as part of our 2043 vision for our community, we want to make sure that we have a vibrant, active community, one that's happy and prosperous, and that mental health and wellbeing is the cornerstone to each and every family in the community. We're going to hear from a number of different speakers today, and I don't know we've got uh, Kadisha and Anthony a little bit later on, but as I conclude today, we're going to be hearing from uh, a wonderful speaker, Mr Nathan Bulk, who you already met, who's our Master of Ceremonies, but he's one of our keynote guest speakers today. Um, he is the representative of the Officer, Office of the Premier's Advocate for Suicide Prevention and Community Resilience. And Nathan has overcome some post-traumatic stress disorder and major depression. And he will talk a little bit about his journey today. And while facing his mental health challenges, he was looking for a voice to help him, which unfortunately he could not find at the time. But now he fills those very shoes he once searched for, dedicating his life to help those struggling to get back on their feet. I think we can all say that Nathan is an inspiration to many in our local community. And I look forward to hearing him and our other guest speakers today. Lastly, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance, showing your commitment to be here, and I pass over now to Mr. Nathan Bowen 
to give his keynote address. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Glenn Doherty, and especially about breaking the cycle. Um, in the end, if you don't start breaking the cycle now, then this is going to continue going round and round. You are not alone. But as you can see in this room, there's so many of us here in the same boat. So do what you need to do and reach out, ask for help when needed. So, I never could have imagined that the greatest battle that I would ever face was not out there on the battlefield amidst the bullets or the bombs or the guns or the explosions, no. But would instead be right here, back home, in the comfort of my own lounge chair. For it was here that I would meet an enemy that would show no mercy and meet an enemy that would get closer to killing me than anything else ever did. Growing up, I was a uh, pretty average kind of kid. I wasn't at the, in the cool group at school. I didn't have the book smarts or any unsung talents, no. I worked hard for every grade that I got. But there was one thing that I did have, and I had more of it than I ever could have imagined. And that was this unrelenting drive and ambition to succeed and achieve. You see, my brothers and I were brought up living in a shadow. Not just any old shadow, but a shadow rich in success, accomplishment, and achievement. My grandfather was not only a prestigious man, but also a visionary of his time. He was a man who performed great and noble deeds, leaving behind a legacy worthy of being remembered. But in the wake of his tall stories came a young boy's idealised account. An idealistic notion of what success looked like, what it meant to be a man, and what was required to achieve the same. And so I went on a dangerous quest to earn the same myself. Within four years of leaving school, by the ripe old age of just 21, I'd earned a certificate three in geoscience, I'd worked in the mines, I'd worked on the oil rigs, I was a volunteer firefighter for the country fire service, I'd joined the army and I'd risen to the ranks of special forces. Yes, I was young, but I was on the move. I became a special operations engineer, trained and specialising in explosives, IED warfare, high-risk search, chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear warfare, and advanced decontamination, just to name a few. But in wartime, our primary job role was the search and clearance of improvised explosive devices. In short, my job was to find the hidden bombs buried in the ground. A dangerous job, and a job where every step could potentially be your last. And so by the age of just 21, I found myself supporting TAG East, or the domestic military, uh, domestic military counter-terrorism version um, of SWAT or Star Force. At 22, I did my first tour to Afghanistan, where on average a tour my teams might find two or three of these hidden bombs buried in the ground. My team alone found 26, two of which I found myself, two strikes in which I found myself personally involved in. At 23, I attempted SAS selection, one of my greatest accomplishments, but also one of my biggest heartaches, for after finishing the course, I was deemed not suitable. I'd lost 15 kilos in 21 days, voluntary self-destruction, all to stand alongside the elite of the elite of the special forces. 
And then at 24, I then deployed back on my second tour to Afghanistan as an engineer on a tour that ended up being far rougher than my first. Over the course of my two tours, I have been blown up twice. My vehicle that I was driving exploded, and I was standing next to another vehicle when that too exploded. I've had RPGs fly meters over my head, I've had RPGs fly straight past our chopper in mid flight. I have been missed by an enemy sniper from only half a meter away, from almost two kilometers away. It was a big shot. I have found myself contemplating my own death, laying on top of IEDs. I've been pinned down by enemy gunfire. Do you know what bullets sound like when they fly up your shoulders? Like, <laughs> Me and two of the mates found ourselves pinned down on the side of this hill. And now imagine yourself hiding behind a rock no bigger than your mum's watering can. <laughs> you see the rock in front of your face wobble back and forth with a bullet ricochet off right in front of your face. Good times. I have carried mates off the battlefield. I have lost mates. And I have, for me personally, seen enough death to last me a long time. However, none other situation compares to the night I found myself having to clear this old Russian fighting pit. It was 2 a.m. We just hiked about 10 kilometers onto target. It's about minus 10. And it was called forward, they're like, bolts, you're up. And it was this trench system on the top of this hillside that I had to go out and clear. And I still remember standing on the edge of that trench, about to go in there, and remembering the briefing that I got. They're like, bolts, we know there's bombs in there, so keep your wits about you. But then I also got my intelligence briefing. I said, Bolts, we know there's IEDs in there, but we also know that they know our procedures. You're about to use a metal detector to find bombs that have no metal in them. Good luck. I was searching through, clearing the ground, and I remember the ground had snapped frozen nearly an inch thick. I had to bash through the top surface of the soil and suddenly I remember seeing this big chunk of dirt just crack. And I was like, yeah, let's capitalize. And in the backwards motion of pulling back, suddenly I hooked something and this package the size of a tissue box came flying out of the wall and landed right in front of my face. So I'm laying on my stomach. lands right there in front of my face. Instantly I knew what had happened. I had just ripped the battery pack of an IED, one of those hidden bombs, out of a seating area. And committed the biggest sin in dealing with these bombs and disturbed it. I froze. Just no thoughts, no nothing. Just disappears. No training, no nothing to prepare for a moment like that. Suddenly, I, my mind comes to, and I see this perfect loop of wire running out of it and running directly underneath me. I was laying on on the pressure plate, the switch, and I've missed it. What do you do in that situation? For me, there's not much you can do. This is it. Move and die, your number's up. You've rolled your dice and this is it. Long story short, I ended up managed to get myself out of that situation that night. However, the thing is though, the main pressure plate was underneath my chest. But if I had set that bomb off that night, I probably would still be in here today. Because the problem was, was that the main charge wasn't underneath me, it was underneath five of my mates who were sitting in the pit directly behind me. Almost taking my own life was something I could deal with, but almost costing the lives of five of my mates was something I'd never took too kindly for myself. What this night would never leave me. For what happened in those moments for many years, I was unable to describe. The dread, the fear, the aloneness, the unknown, the end. No words existed to make sense of what 
eyes had seen and what I had been through. And so I did what any man believes he should do. I bottled it and I buried it as deep and as distant as I could. I've been told that I have, within the six years of school, I have, within the six years of leaving school, I've lived more in my short life than many may live in a lifetime. I guess the stories, the stories I'd always wanted and the adventures that I strove to live, I had done them. I left school on a mission and I was hitting this world real hard, chasing lofty ambition by none other than the sheer belief that I could. I had stood tall at the tip of the spear with the Australian Special Forces on the front line of war and I had lived to tell the tale. And now backed by a life full of experience, I had a full life ahead of me and a world to conquer and succeed in. But when I came home this time, from my second tour, something was different. There was something off. There was something stirring, a pain like I had never felt. And this was no physical pain. That I was used to. This was something else. And it was so overwhelming, so intense. It felt like it was ripping me apart from the inside out. And so unsure what it was, I did my best to ignore it and made use of the coping strategy that I'd always used in my past. I bottled it and I buried it as deep and as distant as I could. Out of sight, out of mind, I pushed it aside, hoping and believing it will all just go away. But by the age of 26, with the Afghan war now long behind me, I found myself battling a new war. A war no man can prepare for. And a war of unparalleled intensity. The ambitious, confident and proud man that left the war returned home a stranger. The mirror showed this reflection of a man I still knew. But the man of the Nathans, no longer me, came shackled by the tortures of my own thoughts, a mind just crippled by its past, an empty vessel, alive, but by no means living. I was trapped in this place of limbo, confused, by my own thoughts, the same and very thoughts that had taken me to the pinnacle of success, did nothing more now than reinforce my own pathetic being, my own weakness, my own fragility. They told me that I was useless. They told me that I was worthless. They called me a burden and a liability to my mates. I could no longer fathom that someone could possibly love me. I couldn't fathom why my friends liked me. I became ashamed of my own inability to cope. And ashamed that I had let everybody down. And by the age of 27, tired, exhausted and run down, I had finally run out of reasons. Sleep was all I desired and to sleep forever became the most merciful thing. I was done. My entire life I'd always been the one thrown with the punches. Suddenly I found myself on the receiving end. Hit by an uppercut that I did not see coming. A blow that knocked me flat on the floor and took me to the brink of ending it all. However, at this point, I did manage to get just one thing right. With nothing left, I finally reached out and got help. And only now, was I truly ready to accept? I was no superhero. I was no elite warrior. No highly trained, cold-blooded killer. No. I'm just an ordinary man struggling with what he's been through, just like anybody else. And only now did I realise. But if I had all the answers to help my 
myself, then I wouldn't be in the position that I'm in right now in the first place. And so with the support of a psychologist, I slowly worked to unravel the damage that war had caused. And the period that followed would best be described as the greatest battle that I ever faced. I had to delve deep into the heart of my own memories and resurface all the pain, all the suffering and all the trauma that I had spent so many years trying to bury and forget. Over and over again, I had to bring it all out. And my God, it hurt. But I had to, for none other reason than I had to learn to try to make sense of what my eyes had seen and what I had been through, so that one day, just maybe, I could finally allow it all to rest. And then in late 2016, after years of hard work with my psychologist, the penny finally dropped when a childhood dream presented itself. For under the blanket she slept, this off-road racing sidecar that my dad used to race back in the 80s. Beaten and battered by a long rough life, she was in need of a lot of work and best described as ready for the scrap heap, but within its battered shell, I saw myself had a feeling that was mutual. Like the story of Seabiscuit, a broken jockey and a cast aside horse. They find the best in each other and give each other the chance that nobody else would. This moment, and so over the next year, our project managed to complete overhaul and restoration rebuilding the old war horse, the old three-wheeled chariot back to its former glory, and in the process rejuvenating my sense of purpose, spirit, and sense of direction. This moment carried me further than I ever could have imagined. And before I knew it, I had a mantelpiece full of trophies from sidecar racing. I established Bolton Brothers, a psychology company committed to supporting Males to have the courage to speak up and reach out and ask for help during times of crisis and need. I found myself appointed on councils and committees on the topic of suicide prevention and early intervention to help others who have walked a similar path. And I became a guest speaker to not only break the very stigma that stopped me from receiving help when I needed it most, but to also remind others that life does exist after struggle. My life went from zero to hero in what felt like overnight. And by all accounts, I was back. And now here I stand at age 32, sharing you all this story for just one simple reason. From the cult movie classic, Rocky and Rocky Balboa, it's not about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Those last three words, keep moving forward, they, they are the toughest of them all. I always thought it was my war experiences that made a man out of me. No. They were merely just a catalyst that would set into motion this chain of events that would ultimately test me right to my very core. They taught me to never lose hope. And as dark or as bleak as a day may find you, there is always tomorrow. As one sun sets, another will rise, and with that, another opportunity to move on from yesterday. Your lowest point is not a place to fear, but more so a place to learn. As a famous philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, once said, only great pain is the ultimate liberator of the spirit. And I doubt that such pain makes us better, but I know it makes us more profound. It is out of our struggles that are the prime movers 
within our day-to-day -day lives. For it is they that force us to make the tough decisions. Our struggles not only have the ability to drive change within ourselves, but they also have the ability to reshape our very character and our lives as we currently know. Yes, they are our pain, and yes, they are our suffering, but they are also our greatest teacher, passing on lessons that we will never forget. From my service and my tours, I found myself quite beaten and battered on top of post-traumatic stress disorder and major depression. I have hearing loss and tinnitus. I have a compressed spine, T3 to T6, from a parachuting accident and when I was blown up. I have damaged both the ligaments in both my shoulders. I've torn the cartilage in my knee twice. I've minimal cartilage left in my hips and I've had bilateral hip surgery requiring two years of rehabilitation. End of my career and a way in which I once lived. But it's funny though, because with everything said and done, I always seem to get asked the same old question. Nathan, for the injuries you've sustained and the way your life is now, was it all worth it? That, that is the question of all questions. But my answer to that was this. Mates I've made, the stories I have to tell, but more importantly, the man that I have become. I wouldn't change a thing. But, but, be fucked if I'd ever do it all again. <laughs> and that's the beauty of growing old. You only need to do it once, live and learn. Follow your dreams and never give up on yourself. And at the end of your life, die as a proud old man, having lived a life worth living and having left a legacy proud of a man that your grandkids can remember you by. Thank you. Well, this is awkward because I'm the MC as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Nathan, for that uh, gripping story time. <laughs> well, give me two seconds. Uh, I would now like to introduce our second speaker to the stage. An amazing, high-profile, passionate, and inspiring African-Australian woman an award-winning human rights activist, inspirational speaker and mentor. She is a woman of immense courage who has given women and minority groups a voice at local, state and international levels, providing advocacy for equality and diversity and inclusion on domestic violence, mental health, cultural safety, racism, migrants and refugees. Having fled a war-torn country and gaining refugee, refugee status here in Australia, she is now the founder of the Desert Flower Centre Australia that specialises in holistic and comprehensive approach to reconstructive surgery and trauma-informed care for women impacted by fem female genital mutilation. She is a TEDx speaker and an empowering woman with a goal to change culture, behaviour and the power imbalances that lead to violence against women and children. I would like to warmly and please welcome to the stage Khadija Vlad.
and the fight for survival, recognition, and respect. And I would also like to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. As a former refugee now calling Australia Adelaide home to me, it's always important to pay respect to those on whose country I now am privileged to have found safety and a place to call home. I am so honored to be here today. This is my first uh, outing <laughs> since COVID. <laughs> so I am hoping the COVID brain might give me a break so I can actually make sense. I don't know about you, I haven't worn a bra for a while, you know, washing <laughs> the clothes. Yeah, just been letting everything hang a little bit. Yeah, just three D things, movement it's been going on in my house. But I am hoping <laughs> that since we had a nice blessing this afternoon, that may actually impact my state of mind. But no, I honestly I am honored to be here today. Mental health is one of my favorite topics because I think it's so important, it's such a huge part of our lives, and it always saddens me just how. It's left silence and the stigma and the shame that has been attached for it to it for so long continues to hinder people and our communities and individuals' ability to thrive. I want to thrive. I don't know about you, but I don't want to survive. I want to thrive. I've spent years surviving, but at some point, we all want to thrive. I want to share my story of mental health. Because in sharing my story, I'm also sharing the story of so many refugee and migrant people who have come to Australia and call it home. But our journey with mental health is a more complex one. Our understanding of mental health is very complex. And that's how I actually met Cindy in various topics I was covering at Morial the Center around mental health, called communities and how we support them. I wasn't born in Australia. I was born in Sierra Leone in the west of Africa, a place most people don't know about. Let's actually challenge you. Who knows where Sierra Leone is? Okay, not too bad, not too bad. The first most people will have heard of Sierra Leone was when Blood Diamond came out, right? Because Leonardo Caprio was bloody in it. That meant everyone was watching. No, women were watching. Um, people were watching. Blood Diamond was about the diamonds the Sierra Leone has. I have none on me. Just so we're very clear in this conversation, I have none on me. But Sierra Leone does have a lot of black diamonds, and we had a 13-year civil war as a result of this. So I became a refugee at the age of three. So at the age of three, the home I knew, the family I knew, and everything I knew changed. War had broke out. Bombs were dropping everywhere. People were trying to kill me and my family. I have a five-year-old son now, and when he was three, I would stare at him and think, what a different experience we were having in the world. When I was his age, I was running for my life. I was being put on the bed, told to hide and stay quiet. At three in Australia, he was watching Peppa Pig all the time. <laughs> Mommy, I want a nice apple. <laughs> Mommy, I'm cold. <laughs> Mommy, my teddy bear. <laughs> I'm like a snake in that house. <laughs> At three, I was hiding. At three, I was scared all the time. I, at three, I was losing family members. At three, I wasn't sure I would grow up to be the 32-year-old person I'm here today. We fled Sierra Leone and ended up in Gambia. But before we got to Gambia, let me talk about my grandfather for a little bit because he's a very interesting man. So my grandfather was a chief. So technically, he should all be you know, calling me Queen Khadija, but I'll forgive you all, you didn't know any better. But my grandfather was a chief, which makes me a princess. Ah, oh, there's a whole thing about it. But he had three wives. This is what makes him interesting. Don't ask me why one person, man, needs more than one wife. I'm just saying, man, maybe one. Do you need more? I don't think so. I think one is enough. But he had three wives. So this means that I come from a big, big, big family of cousins and aunties and uncles. And as a single woman, I'm hoping I don't swipe right on any of them on Tinder. Because that would be a shame. Um, yeah, the struggle is real. It is very real. But I, have, I, came, I came from a very big family. And we had to flee because my grandfather was politically involved. So our family were targets. So to me, I was considered a threat to somebody. I mean, I don't know about you. When was the last time you spoke to a three year old? All they want is their food, give them an iPad, and I just wipe their butt. <laughs> They're not a threat to anyone. But that would change my perception of the world, this world that said I was equally a threat, but also very vulnerable at the same time. And that is possible, that you can occupy those 
spaces. When we got to Gambia, we settled up in a what I call an unofficial refugee camp. In this camp, I saw things. You think the war, I saw things, but I saw things here as well. Hunger, people going hungry, restriction of movement, being sanctioned and told what you can or can't do, dependency on state systems, giving you message. What does that sound like? COVID-19, we'll get to that later. But I wanted to highlight that. So not being able to hope or dream of a future, I can see beyond every single day. There was no time to dream of having a good life or will I become a doctor or lawyer or somebody just talks way too much and people are hoping she shuts up. You know, I didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> but that was my reality. Then we got told that we were coming to Australia because we had gone through the refugee process. We had told our story numerous times and I will never forget those interviews. You know, you had this white man in a suit, not dissimilar to Nathan in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, and Nathan yeah, sat there with his suit, started asking us a bunch of questions. At this time, English was my eighth language. Yeah, I know, it's very impressive. You'll speak one. It's not your fault. No, it's not. <laughs> now I speak three. It's not as impressive anymore, but you know, it's still what's going on. But this man is asking me a bunch of questions, and English is my eighth language. I remember my mom saying to me, you know, just shake your head and smile, Khadija. No matter what he says, just do that. <laughs> How many of us have seen that in the faces of our new and migrant community? So often you talk to them and you're just like, and you think they understand you, they're like, yes, yes, yeah, sure, sure, I'm liking Australia, I like the sandwich very much, yeah, no, But that was our experience. So we went through most of these interviews with me just smiling at this naked person sitting there and talking this, like, how did I enjoy this story? And just saying, yeah, sure. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we could actually understand half of what they were saying. But we went through three interviews, and I will never forget the day they told us that Australia was taking us in. Because we didn't get to choose which country was going to take us in. And in a lot of ways, it didn't matter. We just wanted a place where we could call home and be safe. A place where people were not trying to kill us. So I was probably, what, 12 when we got news. Australia was taking you in. And guess what our first question was? Where the bloody hell is that? <laughs> we didn't know where Australia was. We never heard of Australia. We knew where the U.S. was. And let me tell you, with the current affairs in the U.S., I thank my God every day they didn't take us. <laughs> I, I don't want to be there. <laughs> But they said Australia was, was taking us. And we said, well, we don't know where that is. And I remember this was around the Sydney Olympics in 2000. And somebody who thought they were really smart, and it's always that person who thinks they're smart, but they're not, said, well, Australia is at the end of the world, and after that, there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> How comforting. How very comforting. Thank you. Thank you, smart. Thank you. But you know what, I wouldn't have changed anything for the world. It took us three days to get to our new home. We went from Gambia to Senegal, then we got to France, and there's nothing you can tell me. I have been to France, even if I stayed at the airport the whole day, you would not tell me otherwise, okay? The airport is France, okay? It is France. Bonjour, ça va? Yeah, I got a few French there. But we were at the airport for most of the day before we flew to Singapore. And when we got to Singapore, this is when things got interesting. I'm like, okay, this is what we're in for. We went to the bathroom to wash our hands. And we tried to turn the tap this way, nothing happened. We turned it that way, nothing happened. I'm not a gentle person, I'm like, nothing happened, force. Then we saw somebody just glide by and slide their hand under and the water came out. Like, is this what we're in for, really? This? Things that can't be open? We got into the plane from Sydney, then we got to Adelaide on the 9th of June, 2001, just a couple of days before the Queen's birthday. I always remember that. And when we landed, to be honest with you, I think my mom, my sister and I wanted to kiss the floor. The only thing that stopped us from doing that was that everyone was staring at us already. And we did not want to be staring at any longer. <laughs> so we just kept it in. But what a moment it was for us to finally arrive in our new home. Thinking we were safe. And in some ways we were safe. But in other ways, we would discover new challenges and new 
ways of not being safe because safety depends on context. But we arrived in Adelaide, we lived at Torrensville, we had a, a place, we went around town, I remember our first trip to the city, we saw so many Asians, my mom was like, I think we're in the wrong continent, I think they brought us to the wrong place. <laughs> really? It had to be explained to her that Australia was in the Asian Pacific, she wasn't flown into the, to the wrong country, she was in the right place, she's like, oh, okay, no problem, no problem. But it took a while to settle. You know, I remember you know, catching buses and people not wanting to sit next to people like us. People telling us, you know, to go back where we came from and going to school and being called a black monkey. And having to go home ultimately to my mom and saying, what is the problem? And for the first time in my life, after 13 years of being in this world, taking for granted my skin color, which was nothing to me, it was just as natural as breathing and was just there, becoming aware of this word called racism. And my mom having to explain to me that by virtue of the color of my skin, there were people who thought I was less than, people who thought I wasn't good enough, and people who looked down on me. And that was what we were now experiencing. This will challenge my mental health. To me, racism created a, a new sense of not being safe in a way that I was not unsafe before. Yes, I worried about bombs dropping and other people trying to kill me. This one was different, this sense of I'm not safe as a 13-year-old black little girl. Who is going to bump into me? Who is going to push me? Who is going to want to tell me I should go back to that horrible place I've come from? Why wasn't my home welcoming me? Why was I not safe? But more than that, why was I having nightmares? I thought once I got onto the plane and got here, it should be good, right? It should be like heaven, hell, come from hell and now I'm in heaven. But that wasn't the case. My past followed me, especially as a child. Traumatic events have a way of mapping out your brain and mapping out the way you see your, the world. I remember going to school with all these other 13 year old little girls at Mitchum Girls High School. Don't ask me why my mom sent me to a girl's school. I think she thought girls were less racist. She's never met little girls. She has no clue what girls are capable of. Okay? They can bully you without batting an eye. And you're like, what just happened? What, what just happened? But now you're out, okay? But that's what happened. But here I was, being in a school, looking at these other 13-year-old girls. I had lost my innocence. I didn't see the world as being innocent. I saw the world as a series of places that were unsafe and an accident always waiting to happen. I was hyper-vigilant, always jumping. What's gonna happen next? The sound, whoop! A smell reminded me of something. Always waiting for something to happen to me. And when you added racism to that, it's like, ooh, what if what I'm trying to say doesn't sound right? What if my accent is too thick? What if, what if they're laughing at me? What, what if and what that? School was a challenge. Because I was 13, but my brain wasn't 13. I have experienced things no 13-year-old should have seen or experienced. Too early. But I showed up. Because guess what, I also had a mama who was like, you're bloody gonna show up. <laughs> so when I said to her, school is hard, people are bullying me, I don't wanna go back. She said, well, Khadija, I suppose having escaped war and trauma and a whole range of other bad things, I guess you could let a bunch of little girls scare you away. I'm like, why can't you be empathetic like everyone else? <laughs> like, why can't you be nice? You know, come here, darling, hug. You know, that would have worked too, thank you. <laughs> but not my mama. She's a survivor. She comes from that old school. You get up and you just show up. There's good to that, there's negatives to that. But I did show up because she made me show up to school. I started speaking up a bit, little bit more, started communicating my needs. But one of the things that got me through was a lady who worked in the library, Miss Shannon. I called her my white mom. Miss Shannon was the librarian. She wasn't a counselor, she's just a librarian. And I was like, the just is not a sign of disrespect, but just saying that was her role. But what she would go on to do for me is so much more than that. So I'll be in the classroom, they would just decide to play a movie, and that movie would just have gunshots, you know, randomly, of course, why not? Nobody was screaming and go, maybe Khadija doesn't want to watch this. And the movie would start, and that things would go off, and then I'm hiding under the desk going, oh, what just happened? And then I would run up to the uh, sick room and stay there. Miss Shannon would come down from the library, she got me a little radio tape, 
she got an African CD. I mean, I'm West African. The CD was uh, was uh, South African. Hey, we was in Africa, okay? That was the point. We're all the same. <laughs> Put the tape in, and she got me my first teddy bear at the age of 13. She had nothing to say. There are no words to say to, to a 13 year old in that situation. She would give me the teddy bear and play this tape, and I would listen to it and walk that teddy bear until I had calmed down enough to get back to class. You remember when I said Fisher said Liberia? I was saying she wasn't together as a counselor. There was a counselor in the school. But this Liberian, this woman, would do what I guess called to her as a human being, that I was a child who was scared. And what do kids need? Comfort. No matter their cultural background, no matter whether you can speak the same language, our needs are actually the same. So she gave me something that reminded me of home, but could suit me, not scare me. And a teddy bear. This woman will help me get to high school. I say this to say, I, like so many other refugees who have come to Australia, come with trauma. Whether we acknowledge it or not, we do come with trauma. Whether it was food insecurity or women who were raped during the war and taken as slaves, little girls who were forced into FGM, female genital mutilation, or forced child marriage, children who had their parents killed in front of them. You would have noticed I've never even mentioned my father in this story because he was killed during the war. So I was raised by a single mom and my sister. But we have so many other young people who don't even have their moms who were displaced and are now in Australia as unaccompanied minors with our family and no one to protect and fight for them. I'm not even the worst case. I went on to study a double degree of law and international studies. Not despite not having complex PTSD, because that was my formal diagnosis, complex PTSD. And my mom said, what the fuck is that? <laughs> <laughs> what, a who? A complex what? <laughs> she will be fine, she's African. <laughs> and the psychologist, it doesn't work that way. She can be African and still have complex PTSD. Because <laughs> I'll be the first in my family to see a therapist. And maybe one may say the first in a generation within my family to ever step a foot in front of a stranger and say, how are you doing, Khadija? Mm, well, I don't know how I'm doing. But I was. I was 13 when I started seeing a family therapist. And my mom was not happy about this. Because like most other people from cultural, linguistically diverse community, A, mental health is not real. It's just something you push through. Or you're possessed by the devil. So you need a pastor or an imam or somebody to pray the devil away from you. Or you just need to push through it and you'll be fine. Because we've always been survivors. There's always something happening, poverty, wars, everything. We have no time to think about mental health. There's even a word in our language for mental health or depression or anxiety. How do you even name that? We don't have the words. So it wasn't shocking to me my mom felt this way. But I was a 13 year old in pain. I couldn't sleep, I had insomnia, I had chronic fatigue, I was hypervigilant, meaning I was always exhausted, my muscles hurt from trying to keep safe. But most of all, I was depressed as hell. Thoughts of killing myself, thoughts of wanting it all to end, despite having come all the way to Australia and having a new home, it didn't change how I felt. And the settlement issues I face here, whether it was racism, sexism, ageism, just the challenges of being a teenager stuck between two different cultures, wanting to go to school and be like everyone, hey mate, but then having this stinking culture of food in your bag that your mom insists you bloody take to school, did not help. <laughs> and then going home to your mom, it's like, oh, there's a kissing scene on TV, cover your eyes, can you just cover your eyes, it's too much. <laughs> they just kissing, for Christ's sake. But stuck between different cultures and ways of life and just being in the middle of that, just wanting to be heard and seen and wanting the images, the pictures, the nightmares to stop. So when I was told I needed to see a therapist, this had never been heard before in my family or community. My mom was like, we're going to keep this hush hush. Nobody knows, Khadija. Don't open your big mouth. Ooh, oopsie, wrong child to tell that. <laughs> I will never forget my first appointment. I sat there, thought, what is this woman going to do for me? She said, how are you, Khadija? I don't know. How am I supposed to be? <laughs> no, tell me how you feel. I don't feel anything. 
And you have to be, remember, I have to translate whatever my answers will be to this woman in multiple other languages to get to the English part. She's asking me to name feelings. I don't even have words in my own language for. She's asking me to trust her with a lot of ways she represents a system that constantly discriminated against me. A system where a lot of people, for example, on visas are worried will be utilized against them to make a case maybe to send them back home. But most of all, a system, one that my mom was very worried, would label me crazy. Because it's not mental health in my community, it's just you're crazy or you're fine. It's not in between. She said, they're going to label you crazy. Then you will be the Prime Minister of Australia. <laughs> she had high ambitions. <laughs> oh, it's not too late. Don't, don't laugh. Wait until you see me on your TV screen giving you a speech. Then you'll be like, oh, wow. there we go. <laughs> but that's what she thought. Her concerns were, whatever I said in those sessions will go on to impact my future. She was being a mom. Misguided, but a mom who did not understand this new therapy system. Because guess what? Nobody actually explained it to her. They just said, your daughter is struggling, she needs to see this person. And that was the end of the conversation. But I spent years, and to this day I'm still in therapy. I love therapy. I don't know about you, but the safe space, one hour, somebody just listens to me, no interruptions. Where else are you going to get that? <laughs> I love therapy. Yeah. So I went to therapy. I looked at this woman, she was, her name was Maria. She didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with her. But we spent years learning about how to have this relationship. She learned from me and I learned from her and we worked out a system. But I also took every chance to tell other people in my community I was in therapy. Remember I wasn't meant to tell them? <laughs> she was like, what did you do today, Khadija? Oh, I went to see this white woman to talk about my feelings. <laughs> you, you did what? Oh yeah, yeah, it's a thing. You go and you sit in a couch, you talk to them about your feelings. You are such a white girl, Khadija. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> issues and, and I, I, I'm struggling and some days even if I, nothing is happening it's good to talk to somebody slowly I normalize the words mental health the words depression <laughs> the words complex PTSD and a black person seen a therapist I was laying the foundations for what would end up in my work as an adult advocacy on how we need to engage culturally and linguistically diverse communities around mental health I was the guinea pig though, the starting point. Mental health for my community is a hard thing. We have spent years surviving. The idea of slowing down, even for a second, to catch up to those feelings, to name them, almost feels like it will be our undoing. Does that make sense? If you just stop. Who's noticed that during COVID? The slowness of life has caught up to us. I've spoken to community members who are like, Khadija, I find this very triggering. These restrictions, it feels like we're back in war. It's a lack of food insecurity. People buying toilet rolls like they have diarrhea. I don't know what's going on. I'm like, I don't know either. I don't know whether there's a diarrhea outbreak, but the toilet rolls, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on. I mean, did you notice nobody was buying spices as well? Just rice and everything else? Is that a thing? Anyway. But people were feeling triggered because COVID-19 related restrictions and situation does feel very warlike, ve feels very refugee camp like. So if you think it's hard, imagine the layer of having been in those situations and this amplifying your sense of not feeling safe. I had a lot of conversations with grandmas, older generation, uncles, grandpas who for the first time in their lives haven't been in Australia had to acknowledge what they had been through is what was making this situation harder for them and that they needed to talk to somebody so COVID has been hard for all of us it has amplified the inequalities we knew existed in our society and I read a saying the other day that said we're all in the same storm but not in the same ship. And I thought, that sounds good, because you could be in a yacht, or you could be in a float boat, or you could just be in a paddle. We're not actually all on the same boat. How COVID is impacting us depends on your level of access to support, whether you can afford to call a therapist, whether you can drive to a therapist, whether you could call a hotline and have somebody who speaks your language talk back at you. 
whether maybe that system may actually discriminate against you if you're a person of color, if you were indigenous, whether you could be scared, your kids could be taken away, if you have knowledge you had a mental health challenge. Or in my case, as somebody who I think is high functioning, it could just be even talking to somebody sometimes can be exhausting to me. So I turn to my community, I turn to my family and friends to stay connected. But most of all, I acknowledge what I'm actually experiencing. I am tired and stressed and depressed due to COVID. I don't know about you, but let's name it. COVID has left me depressed. So I can't move around the way I used to. Who has felt that way? The restrictions, never knowing what's going to happen. Who's felt stressed by that? Not having the end date to this situation. I feel stressed by that. Even if we cure the virus, I'm actually stressed about what life could be like. I'm stressed that I have a five-year-old son as a single mom who is like, mommy, why are we washing our hands so much? I don't know, baby. Then he asked me, when is your money coming? I'm like, you better call COVID and ask them when my money is coming. Ask COVID, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but even at five, he's aware the world has changed and he's anxious. So I am anxious as well. So I think we have to be kind to ourselves. That's where I want to end tonight. Let's be kind to ourselves. Acknowledge how you're feeling. It's okay to grieve the life we used to have. This is a mourning of some sorts. This is trauma that is actually happening as we speak. COVID is creating trauma for a whole generation of people. COVID is creating complex PTSD, disability, mental health, a whole range of challenges for people. So it's not something small. So don't gaslight yourself by going, oh, it's not that hard, there are people have it harder. That, no, it doesn't matter. What you experience is also hard, and that's enough. The challenges of not knowing what our world may become is hard. Not knowing if you get back your job, being maybe on the door for the first time in your life, not knowing if you can get off the door, not knowing what to say to our kids about not being able to play with everyone or needing to protect grandma and nana because they have a compromised human system or not being able to talk to your family or access them or see them like those in Victoria. It is okay to be sad and to grieve the life we used to have, to grieve the situation we're in and to even grieve the one we don't know may come. It is okay to say I'm sad. It is okay to say I am not okay. And it is okay to also say, I like some of the changes. Don't feel guilty. I like some of the changes we have. We have never been more accessible as a society. We have never come together so much as a community. Have you noticed that? How we have actually come together tighter. So I like those bits. What has worked for me over the years as somebody who has complex PTSD, goes to see their therapist, has a counselor on the side, that's my side chick, like I have a husband who is a psychologist and then, you know, I have a side piece, anyway. That would make sense to people who are like, what is a side piece? But I have a team of people who support my mental health, who I have on standby, and sometimes I have cold words I send to a friend or an emoji that says, I am not okay, or I just need time out and a space. I have people I call on to say, can you look after the baby? Mommy, it's time. I need time out for myself. Whatever you need to do to look after you, it's okay. Reach out to those who are available to you. We have a lot of support in the community, but they mean nothing if we don't actually access them. And for those who are services in the room, be more accessible. Not everyone can drive to come to you. Not everyone can pick up the phone. Maybe be more innovative in the way you engage communities as we go through what is, I think, a global trauma, a national trauma, and an individual trauma for us all. It is okay that we're not okay, but I think more than anything, we will get to a point where we'll be okay. That's the reality. That is something we can bank on. Thank you. Absolutely fascinating. I am a young, privileged white adult. I don't know the first thing when it comes to racism. Um, what families fleeing war torn countries go through, come here and then to be discriminated further. 
uh, for me personally, from what my experience and what I know, PTSD is uh, socially accepted for a soldier to have. Most people forget that trauma can happen to each and every one of us. And so don't ever judge a book by its cover. You never know what is lurking underneath for most people. Our third and final speaker tonight, an advocate for mind health and a man on a mission to shift the narrative of mental health here in Australia. At the heart of his message, mates who wear masks, is the desire to empower others with the tools to inspire and activate better conversations and connections but also to build positive communities designed to remove the many masks of mental health. We all have the right to feel safe in seeking support, and we all have the right to get our lives back on track. I'd like to welcome to the stage our third and final speaker tonight, Anthony Hart. Let's go. That's it. 
We've done, we've, we've saved up some money. We bought a house back in Adelaide. We were ready to go and live back in Adelaide and just cruise. <coughs> now, you never know what's around the corner. And so the things that inspired both of us was, was our job. And so both of us had left a perfect world where we were earning good money, we were traveling, to leave all of that and go back to Adelaide it was great for the first few weeks, but then we just hit, it was like a thud. We turned up in Adelaide, we struggled to find the right type of jobs for what we wanted. And within three or four weeks, we started to doubt the decision that we made. And so I talk about a lot of the downward spiral that, that I personally went on. But from March to October, I avoided socialising. I drank too much. Anything that happened, I would flare up and get aggressive for no reason. The pressure that I put on myself to make sure that my fiance was happy, that we could get the right jobs, it just became too much. And to stand here after hearing the previous two stories and think that my triggers, we've all got triggers, was that the job that I'd done in London couldn't be recognised importing cars from different European countries back into the UK, uh, the recruiters couldn't put me into the same type of role that I was doing. I was running a business with six staff and employing and, and generating wealth. Uh, they perceived that I was selling cars. Now, there's nothing wrong with selling cars, but I was running a business, an uh, importing business. And so job after job after job, I just kept declining and I'd never been through anything that tested me and so secretly inside my body the, the serotonin, the chemicals that make you feel happy were slowly draining down. Now I didn't know this and no one does until they first confronted with what I call a mind health condition. And the pressure, unless you go and get help and talk about it, exercise, you know, rest the alcohol, and get decent sleep, the pressure just built up. And for me, that happened so quickly. Six months, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, I was at rock bottom. But from the outside, I was happy, I'd go out socialising, I'd take a, I'd, if I went out to the hotel, I'd drink a, a beer on the way there. And so the, the ego and, and the, and the the prestige of what I'd achieved in London was, was taken away. I had a great job, great income, I enjoyed what I was doing. All that was stripped back. Now, this doesn't happen overnight. The, the negative thoughts that compounded March, April, May, June, right through to October, hit a bottom point where I couldn't sleep. And so that's where I went to my parents' house one night. My mum could see that I wasn't doing that great. As I walked through to the back of the house with Zoe, my fiancé, Mum pulled me aside, got me to try and sign some documents in the study, which was a story. And she shut the door, grabbed me by the shoulders and said, Anthony, honestly tell me how you're feeling. And I tried to give a story, but then broke down in tears. Now, Mum simply said, Go to the GP and tell the GP exactly what you told me. And that's what I did, except I took a list of six or seven points in that the GP just had to either take uh, enough of that information to be able to sign off and give me an antidepressant. I didn't want to go to a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist. I've read about this. I'm not, I'm not going to be going off to get help for my head. No way. I I'd, I'd, I'd bought two houses, I was financially successful, had a gorgeous fiance, came back from London. I, I had everything that I needed in life. And, and that made it so much harder to actually reach out for help. Now, I got so sick that the medication that I was given on that first eight minute consult just didn't suit my body. Now, I don't criticise the medical process that I went through because I'm generally very persuasive in selling product. 
and it was the GP who I was really keen to get a medication off of. But as we all know now, just like an electrician and a plumber, you, you've got to have experts, uh, a team around you, who can actually fix up any problems. And so a clinical psychiatrist who's done a medical degree, they've gone on to study more about the brain, and generally are over 35 until they actually start practicing. They are absolute experts at, at the chemical stuff. Now, on the thoughts, feelings, uh, behavioural stuff, the psych clinical psychologist is absolutely vital. I've got stories which I can share where I was counting lots and lots of things. I'd count words and letters in people's names. I'd count my footsteps. So I, would, I wouldn't be able to walk up on the stage because there were lines. Those things can be fixed by being open and honest and talking to a clinical psychologist. Now, just like getting help for anything in commercial businesses or in any other part of your world, you go to those experts. And that's my real passion and drive is to try and get that message across that we need to go and see those people. Now, I got to that really bad spot and that's how I arrived in Sydney, I got a job after leaving the GP. Nine days later, uh, I went to live in Sydney. Uh, I lasted eight days. The medication wound me up to the point where I couldn't even sleep. Uh, and I was asked to leave the course. I then got the ferry back into Circular Quay uh, and the rest is history. Now, it wasn't until I woke up that I completely overcame my mental health challenges. I was, I was in a, put in a coma for five days as they stabilised my injuries. And the second I woke up, everybody in the world or my world knew what happened. And so there was no problem. Six out of 10 people who lose their life to a mind health condition hadn't seen professional medical help. Right, it's, it's, that, it's that simple, you know. This is a temporary thing that can be managed. I've suffered from anxiety and I manage anxiety, but I'll live a great life. Getting to a professional and being open and honest about how you think, feel and behave gives you a fantastic chance to be able to manage and live a fantastic life. Now, it wasn't until I got stabilised in St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney three months after my accident, uh, I was transferred back to Hampstead. And this is where my ideas and my, my concept of my product came out. Now, I had mate after mate drive out to Hampstead and see me. And every second or third, maybe every fourth person, it was awkward for the first three or four seconds. So if I was friends with Nathan, it would just be really awkward for the first bit, right? And Every second friend throws a joke and we laugh and it's done, right? And it's funny, I got really, I got really upset that every one of my friends accepted it. So why couldn't I have done that before I did what I did? I had 26 operations, uh, I had an acquired brain injury, I had a spinal injury and a tear and I broke both my legs. Now all that could have been completely avoided, right? If I just talked, even confidentially. And what started to happen was, say Nathan, if I can use you, you'd come out to Hampstead and you'd be blown away, you'd be a little bit upset. But then every fourth friend, and if, if, if you came and saw me, you would say anything, can we go for a coffee? And so I'd get thrown into the wheelchair, wheeled down to the coffee shop, and it just happened conversation after conversation after conversation. Nathan would start sharing with me his challenges, and he'd start, his lip would start to quibble, and he would share with me financial relationships, some other trauma, and get really upset. And so this was actually a really good distraction for me, I had a spinal injury, I had an acquired brain injury, and it actually took my head off into a place of kind of solving stuff. 
And so I started to write down four steps to better mind health, which are talk, exercise, alcohol, and sleep. And none of this is rocket science. But I started to talk through the first point, and, I, and, and I'd say to my friends, don't do what I did. I kept all this stuff inside. Number one, talk. So just like you've done today, go and confide in one of your close friends, maybe a, an old school friend, someone that's not me. I've got a lot to try and deal with the next five or 10 years. Confide in that mate, it's gonna be really hard but tell them exactly how you're thinking, feeling, and behaving. They'll buddy up with you and they'll, they'll actually help you through that process. Now the second thing you do straight away is you go straight to a medical professional. You go to your GP, and you tell them exactly how you're thinking, feeling, and behaving. Because the GP's got no way of knowing what's going on or referring you to a psychiatrist or a psychologist if you don't tell them exactly what's going on. GPs are not trained to know everything about the mind. It takes years of study after being a medical doctor to specialise and be a psychiatrist. So they're that first point, very important first point of call. The second thing I absolutely fell into was that there was a swimming pool out at Hampstead. And so every single day I was there for four months. I had a security tag on my wrist because if you do try and take your own life, the chances of a second attempt and third and fourth are very high. So I wasn't able to leave anywhere except go to the swimming pool. Uh, every day, that's all I did. I just swam lap after lap after lap. I didn't know what I was actually gonna do, but it was better than lying in bed. And what started to happen after two or three weeks of doing it every day was that I started to feel happier. And my medications had to start being reduced because medications are fantastic. They they get you up into a good spot. But when your body's producing the same chemical as well, you're almost going to a, like an overdose situation. And so I was becoming too happy. As the news got, <laughs> I, was, I, <laughs> I was becoming really happy. I couldn't walk, I, my brain was, uh, half my head was blown out of the back. Um, I couldn't use, I found out I couldn't use my left arm. I, I was a passionate golfer. And after five months found out that the nerve wasn't growing back. And I was really happy. So the psychiatrist couldn't work out what I was doing. And, and he dug out of me that I was swimming every single day. And the natural chemical that you produce is, is, is so much better. Works in balance with the medication that you get. So choose one that you love doing. It's got to be cardio. And you've got to do it four times a week. Now. I have spoken to thousands of people and given out all of our products as free products. So the, the business that I run, Invigor Wellbeing, which is healthier, happier, builds tools for people to actually confront early signs of stress. So I'm not an expert at suicide prevention. That's what kind of dragged me into this. Um, so it, it's okay to be happy about this topic, but you've got to love what you do on the exercise because if you don't, You'll do it, you actually feel better, and then you'll stop. So consistent change on exercise. And number three is not very popular, is alcohol. Uh, alcohol is absolutely crazy that we should be drinking alcohol if we're, if our thoughts and feelings aren't great, it'll, it'll make us happy, then bang, we get depressed. Now I cannot believe that the medical, people in the medical sector do not absolutely equivocally say no, no alcohol if you're on medication. That's a real passion of mine, is that if you're on a very highly tuned antidepressant that's taken 30 years to get right, you go to a GP, you go to a counsellor, you go to a psychiatrist, you get the right, the medication takes years to get right. And then you throw three or four beers in with that tablet. 
it, 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 it's crazy. But I, unfortunately, still today, <clears throat> and that message isn't getting through. So alcohol to park at rest, reduce or remove. And the fourth thing, which is the first thing that really started to speed up my decline into the depression was sleep, not being out of sleep. So I talk about removing stimulants and getting ready for bed really early, switching off, getting off your telephones, very basic things that if you track those four things, it, it, it isn't rocket science that you, you can better prepare for life's challenges. And I've always done numbers, I love numbers and graphs. Past behaviour or past numbers affect the future, absolutely, in everything. And if you drink five or six beers every night, do no exercise, stay up till three, four o'clock every night, um, you will be more grumpy, you'll snap at people, and there's more chance that you won't be able to confront life's challenges. And so I put it into a product. Uh, it won the 2016 Business Startup of the Year with the Department of Premium Cabinet. And Life Back Tracker was born. So Life Back Tracker is four steps to better mind health. And it's funny, we, we did the pitch for three minutes to about 80 people. And it was called a men, men's mental health tool. And we got 80% of the vote. But I checked the downloads after we built the app, and no one was down. Well, some people were downloading it, but the right the right people weren't downloading it. And so, we even by tweaking it to four steps to better mind health, it still hasn't gone far enough. Uh, Invigor Wellbeing is is our new brand. It'll be the Invigor Healthier Happier app. It's got nothing to do with mental health, suicide, depression, anxiety. It'll, track the, it'll still track those four things. And governments and their, their organisations can support it. We've put about 45,000 into the app at the moment. Uh, the ability to buddy sync up with somebody, to share some really positive messages through the app will happen. And also, even I, I was checking my phone today, I haven't done it for about eight days. Now, my life's kind of back on track, so I don't use it. There's a reset button to give you a 21 day challenge and actually connect up with maybe three or four mates. Uh, there'll be a great opportunity to, uh, to set limits so that your buddy sync mate can see if you're drinking beer, if you're not sleeping, uh, if you're not doing exercise. And it's a very simple process. And I always get asked this, I suppose, so I'll just put this last slide in here, which is, how, how do we build a culture of care? We have scaled our social good business, which is rolling out through business and companies. We've just done 910 train and tram drivers through uh, Tony Braxton Smith, the chief executive, uh, through DITI, it's now DIT. And we rolled out 119 workshops, videos, and, and some talks. Now, spotting the seven signs is what I always get asked. And these are really classic little signs that you can look in someone and think, well, that person, when they were really happy two or three years ago, they're not showing these signs now. They're emotional and teary. They're constantly worried. And they will avoid socialising significantly. You just won't want to go out. You struggle with sleep. Sleep is huge if you're struggling with mind health. You're really happy. Uh, I, I say your thoughts race. You're very reactive. You're not proactive in your, in your day plan. And I, I ran out of petrol three times in the month leading up to the attempt on my life. On the third time I got to the petrol station and I did get there, I didn't have a wallet because, because I was just too quick to get out of the house. So you just don't plan, things are not planned. It's, it's a fight or flight, you, you, your world's going crazy. Small things trigger aggression. 
Um, we've interviewed about 25 people. Uh, we call them Mind Health Champions. And so the corporates that we work with, we send these messages out every week or fortnight. Um, and uh, this should play. You know, it's Cosy from Channel 9, Hit 107 here. I was chatting to you guys uh, before about drawing a line in the sand when a bad moment happens in your life and then just moving on with it. Like, don't let the distance between the moment and actually moving on or getting help be too long because it's going to hurt you big time. The other thing is, there's, there's so many things like, you know, talking, seeing a GP, but the one that I reckon is, is huge is exercise. Now, I'm 136 kilos, so me talking about exercise sounds stupid. But there has got to be a correlation between exercise and mental health. Now, I'm no doctor or psychologist, I don't know, it must be. Let me tell you why and you can try this. When you come home from work and you're all stressed and, and it's like your mind is like a massive amount of knots, like a big bowl of spaghetti, try going for a walk. I do it all the time. And when you go for a walk at the start, you're still all stressed. But watch what happens about a kilometre in. It's like all of those knots sort of slowly unwind and straighten out. And I find that three quarters of the way through my walk, I'm completely de-stressed and I get really creative. Some of the best ideas I think about for my business are when I'm out there going for a walk. So exercise has got to be important for mental health. So, so what we do with our Mind Health Champions, we actually get them to, in their first video, share their most confronting life challenge. Uh, and then how they, what was the first thing they did to, to get over it and, and get themselves back on track, get over it, it's not the right word. We then do a second video, which is the second thing they did, and the third video is the third thing they did. But what it does is it just shows people, uh, prominent Australians, uh, are vulnerable sharing that they, they too had a problem with their mind health, but they got over it. Um, the app is a free app for anyone, anywhere, anytime. It's downloadable. It cannot be traced back to you. Um, which is probably the biggest weakness of the product, but it's been put in there for integrity and safety. For the person who wants to be tracked, it, that's your information. And it just tracks exercise, alcohol, sleep. Uh, and also we've had Samri come up with questions that uh, guide how you're thinking and feeling. So there's eight questions there. So if any questions, I'm happy to take after. My details are on most of my websites and I, it's my real passion to try and stop other people going down that path that, that I should never have gone down. So thank you. Thank you, Anthony. That's uh, it's amazing how you just keep getting pushed and pushed and pushed and you think you're holding on. And Suddenly you start getting irritable, you start snapping at people, and you just temper shortens and no matter what, you still think nothing's wrong, you still think you're okay. Jeez, I was drinking half a bowl of red before work when I was in the peak of my lowest, darkest days. And I had a laugh at my brothers because we all just overlooked thinking nothing was wrong, that that was normal. I figure that I do know a statistic, it's 60% of um, males access services in the year prior to an attempt in their own life. 60%. So it's not like males are not reaching out, but then at the same time, uh, the service providers actually providing what males need. And for me personally, as uh, Anthony was saying, as well as Khadija, seeing a psychologist is absolutely awesome. I absolutely love it. Like, yes, they carried me through some of the darkest days of my life, but why is it that psychology and seeking that, those sorts of services are all about treating dysfunction and ill health? I use it these days for the small things in life, on the wellness side, overcoming smaller obstacles as I continue to get myself better and better and better. It's not just there for when you're broken per se, but it's also there to help what makes it good, what, what is good in your life, great. So, that is the end of the uh, three keynote speech, speeches. Uh, we are now about to go for a break. The time is, sweet as, no worries. So I encourage, we have about 20 minutes for a break um, and then come back into the room after. I encourage all of you to visit the stalls, have a look, have, get to know these services.
and the support networks that are out there in your local community. Um, you are allowed to vertically consume these days at months with the COVID restrictions, so you can eat, talk and drink at the same time, uh, which is um, pretty uh, awesome. Um, any further questions that you have, at the end of today there will be a panel with myself, Khadija, Anthony and another lady named Deborah, or Deb, um, from, if I remember correctly, um, so I'll get back to you there. And so any further questions, please see Cindy at the front in the blue jacket, she'll be able to take any further questions. When you do come back in at about at 20, let's say a quarter past five, 5.15, 5 um, please come back to your same seat. That is one COVID requirement that we are, do have to abide by. So remember when you sat down and please return to the same seat. So we'll see you back here at 5.15, thank you.
what it actually means to someone who's actually have had a lived experience of suicide. So I'll just let you reflect on that for a minute.
country is APHN, it bridges the gap between Commonwealth funding and state funding, so we make sure that we're not duplicating. Thank you, Tim. So the issues group on suicide prevention, they're a working group of the Premier's Council. Um, they consist of 22 senior executives representing each um, of the South Australian government agencies, and it's quite a feat getting them all together in one room sometimes. Um, we've been doing most of our meetings on Zoom because there's so many of them. Um, but they, um, they are able to take on work within their own right and work as a collective, but they also can take, ref they take reference and recommendations from the Premier's Council, do the work, and then actually report back to the Council. They meet monthly um, for approximately two hours, because you can imagine trying to get senior executives from every government agency for longer than two hours is quite challenging. Um, and the South Australian Commissioner for Public Sector Employment, Emma Ranieri, greatly assists that group. Josh T is currently the chair, but we're expecting because he's now been appointed to the Speaker of the House of Assembly, we'll um, have a change there. That's the, um, all of the agencies that actually sit on the issues group. So, like I said, and you'll see there that there's a bit of duplication possibly in that, you know, we have representation from um, Department of Health, for example, and Wellbeing SA, but then we also have another representation from SA Ambulance because we feel that the emergency responders have to be at the table um, because of the nature of the work and, and what we're actually trying to actually improve policy with. So I'll hand over to Tanya now, and um, Tanya will talk a little bit about the suicide prevention networks um, and the, how they actually go through the establishment process. Their main purpose is to drive stigma reduction in place-based communities um, and raise awareness and provide education and resources to the communities that are in. So um, similar to the resources that we actually have on our stand out in the, in the hallway. Thanks, Karen. I know I've got to bring the I'm vertically challenged, sorry. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what the Suicide Prevention Networks do. So currently we have between 39 and 40 established across the state. We, we say we have um, 40 up there, but we have one sitting in what's known as recess at the moment. Cindy down the front smiling at me. Um, Close on 12 months ago, we got a call to say that the Playful um, Network was actually in a bit of bother and they were struggling having people interested and the network was in dire need of uh, reinvigoration. So I started a bit of a process where I sent some emails out from, to people who were previously on the network, got them in a room and we started to unpack what we needed out here at Playford and in the district to get that network going again. Um, thanks to the cute old kudos to Cindy uh, and the council out here, we've actually managed to successfully reinvigorate that network and we have approximately 20 members on that network now, so it's one of the biggest in the state. We've mapped out their plan for the next 12 months and they've got some really great ideas moving forward, provided that Mr COVID goes away and lets us get on with what we need to do. So when we talk about establishing a network, um, Karen, myself and Dan will normally set up an initial meeting with local government councils. So we are aiming to have 68 across the state, and that's one in each council um, region, so we still have 28 to go, and we are in talks at the moment with some of the major metropolitan councils across the state. We've probably noticed a lot more traction since we've had COVID, and the high level of anxiety, depression and mental health issue in the community and people starting to come to their local government communities, reaching out and wanting to know what they can do and how they can get help. So we'll start a conversation with the Mayor and the CEO and any elected board members and we'll tell them how we need to go about setting up that network. We attempt to do a forum in those community areas, inviting all members of the community in and we take registrations of interest of people who might like to be on that initial working party to complete what's known as an action workbook. Now the reason we have the action workbook 
is because it gives us a chance to have a vision and a mission statement, which are vitally important to the network, because that's your branding and how we get the messages out to the community and what you're all about. We need that to get our incorporation for seed funding, and then we step you through all of the action plans and how we move a network forward. We also offer the network members training, and we set up a core committee. So your core committee will sit, um, consist of a chair, a deputy chair, treasurer, secretary, and someone who will take care of public relations and media and marketing. Those positions are vital in the network, and then you can have as many general committee members as you like. Um, I think we had about 80 odd on the Barossa one that was set up last year. And as I said, Plainford's sitting on about 20 at the moment, so one of our really successful ones. We also encourage them to sign the Every Mind, Life in Mind National Communications Charter. We have these on our stand out um, in the foyer there. For anyone who would like to sign up to the Charter, I also have the certificates. This is actually a little booklet that explains the Charter and the eight core principles that you're pledging um, alliance to. And it's very important because it teaches us the language and the safe use of language that we should be using when we're dealing with those people who are um, mentally ill or they are in suicidal ideation. So as Karen, I think, mentioned at the start of the presentation, we never ever use the word committed because it's associated with a crime. So this will actually help people unpack the language that we should be using to reduce the stigma, raise the awareness and help those people that need help. How many of you have looked through your pack? So you're probably wondering what this little beauty is. Just at the Royal Adelaide show alone, about 4,000 of these we give out, and that means for those 4,000 we give out, we have 4,000 conversations. So somewhere between seven and 8,000 each year when Karen and I and teams of volunteers from networks and staff from Wellbeing and OCP are out in the communities, that's how many conversations we're starting. So the idea of the pack was born from a gentleman who lived in the Gap in Sydney. Is anyone familiar where the Gap is in Sydney? Okay, so that was a hot spot for people taking their lives. And there was a gentleman who had a house on the edge of the Gap, and he had a bird's eye view. And he would actually see people go to the edge of the Gap full well knowing what they were contemplating he would boil the kettle and make two cups of tea and he would go out and approach that person and ask if they would like to talk. He was named the Angel of the Gap and he was accredited for saving somewhere in the vicinity of 500 plus lives while he was alive. Sadly, he's passed on. Um, he was awarded, awarded um, an, Australia, uh, an Order of Australia Medal for his services and so was born this little pack. So the idea is if you see someone struggling, could be a friend, a work colleague, or a family member, complete stranger, boil the kettle and start the conversation and ask that person if they'd like to talk to you or, or if they would like to, you know, unpack anything with you. The biggest thing that we find in um, suicide with people who have had an attempt is loss of connection and loss of hope. They're the two to top why people decide to end their life. A couple of little cards in there, and the idea is to swap names and numbers. Now you might say to me, but I'm okay, why would I want to, you know? The idea is if someone thinks that they could be of use to you like you are to them, they're more inclined to swap the numbers and reach out to you when they are at their most vulnerable. We also encourage slip them into your wallet. Someone who has had an attempt on their life and goes to an emergency department. How many of you have been in such a state of distress that you're asked for a phone, phone who can I phone for you? Who do you want me to call? You can have a thousand numbers in your phone and everything just goes blank. So the idea is if the emergency staff find that in the wallet and they associate with that person what that is, they'll say, can we call that support person to you? Vital emergency numbers on the back, Lifeline, Mental Health Services, Suicide Callback Service, Men's Health Line and Kids Help Line, and just a little bit of instruction on the inside. 
We quite often get phone calls saying, can you just send me a thousand of those or can I have 500 of those? We do not supply these to people. I can certainly help you with a template to develop one for your organisation, but with that comes a responsibility that you need to be trained on how to give these packs out and start that life-saving conversation. As soon as we lose this vital resource, it's one of the most vital resources that we have in our suite, so we are very stringent on making sure that people who hand these out and start those conversations are trained correctly. So they're, they're a really, really good conversation start, and this is obviously Playfords, and we have one in our office, and a lot of the networks have them under their own branding also. So just in conclusion, you can see up there we've got our vision, which is for a healthy, livable and connected community for all South Australians. So that's absolutely everyone. Our priorities are to promote stronger communities and healthy environments, and part of that is through the suicide prevention networks, which are community and volunteer-led. Only your individual communities know what you need in this region, and that will differ in the north from the south to metropolitan rural areas. Prevent and reduce suicide incidences and protect and support individuals with mental illness. Progress and strengthen the systems that support mental illness, public health and wellbeing. And at the end of the day, the outcome is for an improved health and wellbeing for all South Australians and reduction in incidence of mental health, illness, injuries and suicide incidents. So just up there are our contact details. So if anyone has any questions or would write, um, like some further resources or information, please come out and chat to us in the foyer. And if we can't help you with something now, we will certainly go away with your contact details and come back with anything that you might need. So the first question is for the panel. So get ready to choose who's going to jump into this one. Um, from your experience, what is the best way to provide support to someone after they've admitted that they're not okay? Sure, I'll give it a whirl. I think the one thing that everyone always goes is if someone confides in me, what do I do? I think that for each and every one of us, it's always our biggest fear. What do I need to say? 
Am I going to do something wrong, say something wrong, cause more harm than good? The biggest thing that you could ever learn is that when, when someone confides in you, all you're really going to do is just listen. You don't need to... You, the worst thing you can actually do is pretend that you know everything that's going on in an individual's life and you become an advisor to that individual. That is not what they need. All they need is someone to non-judgmentally listen to what it is that you are, for what they're saying, and just help provoke the conversation and allow them to talk it out, allow them to make sense of their own problems. And the chances are, they will find their own solution. They are the masters of their own lives. Just listen, provoke a conversation, and yeah, I'll let someone else make sure. I'd like to add to that, that sometimes we also need to be mindful if we're in the space for that conversation. Too often, sometimes when somebody does communicate their needs, it doesn't always mean that we are in that place ourselves where our cup might be low. So I think doing that quick self-reflection, am I, do I have the capacity for this conversation? And I've had to learn that with a lot of my friends. Do you have the capacity? Because if you don't, you may not be fully present for what is very important for that person. And sometimes it's okay to say, is it possible we have this conversation maybe in an hour or two or tomorrow? Or can I get somebody because I myself am not there enough and I want to be present? It's okay to be honest. We can't be everything and everything to everyone. Let's be real, because sometimes don't be disloyal to yourself in wanting to care for someone. And that's a trickier word. We're taught to please and be there for everyone. And this is a gender thing. Women do it a lot. But we don't think about our own cup and maybe are we in that place? Can I receive this conversation? Can I hear you? Because it might be triggering. A, a lot throughout COVID, a lot of people were calling, wanting to talk about how they were being triggered by the, the restrictions and you know how we are impairing their trauma. And the times I had to say before somebody started, what are you actually going to talk about? I just want to know quickly. Because I want to make sure if I have the capacity. And that sounds maybe too blunt for some people. But that was my way of looking after myself. I'm a mom. I have a child to look after. I need to always be mindful of my space so I can be there for this little human who needs me. So if I don't do that, I feel like I'm being disloyal to myself, but also disloyal to this person who I may not have the capacity or the, to be present for them. But also, I don't want later on to be so like, oh my God, gee, they ruined my day. That's not what people are looking for. So I think it's also okay to check with people. Do you have the space for this conversation? So I've been doing the same before. I, I unload on a friend. I go, do you have the space for the conversation I want to have? I'm having a bad day. Can you hold space for me? Are you in a place where you can do If they say no, no offense, I can call somebody else or call one of the helplines where they have people are always available for those conversations. That's what they're there for. They are available. But our friends and family, it's a bit trickier. Especially during COVID, we all have different capacity of our needs and tough times that we're going through. Both sides have to sort of have a bit of more emotional intelligence. Can you hold space for my conversation? Hey, can I hold space for your conversation? And maybe we can plan on when we can have this conversation if somebody else might be best to help. We all want to help, but sometimes we can do damage when we don't actually do the right thing in checking with ourselves and others before we go so deep and get triggered and then more damage is done, which could have been avoided maybe. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, um, I, the way I look at that, uh, I, I, I came into this space in the suicide prevention space and spoke to over 15,000 people and I wasn't, I'm not trained as a psychiatrist or a psychologist. It was really important for me to go and learn the skills. I rang up AUOK in Sydney and became, um, did a three day course to become an ambassador. AUOK is a proven four step process and the, just like um, we've all said here, that the, the second step is just to listen and and that's all it is. Listen and stop trying to solve the problem back. And it's, uh, as, soon as, as soon as we solve the problem back and tell the person what they need to do, we, we lose that trust. It's gone. And um, just to let the person speak it out and just repeat back to them what they've told you and be neutral. Because then, once you've actually left that conversation, Quite possibly, you're the only person in the world who 
they've actually opened up to, and that's a very that's a very sacred relationship. And the second we go back and say to them, well, the solution to fix up that problem is to do this, this, this. If you see them in two or three weeks' time, that person's not going to go back to that confider if they haven't done what they were told to do. So being really neutral, listen and, and repeat back, but never ever give them a solution or tell them what they think they should do. Fantastic. Okay, now I am going to throw to Deb here, um, the Senior Aboriginal Advisor for Baptist Care, and I'm hoping, Deb, that in our time-restricted situation, um, that I can get you to cover a few different topics in regards specifically to Aboriginal community, in regards to stigma around mental health, how mental health is perceived, but again also around um, those multiple issues, homelessness, disability, mental health, and, and how that's all kind of um, uh, is this an issue. Yeah, you're right. So Why are all, I can't see anyone, so I'm trying to maybe you will make it to calm my nerves, but I can't see you, so you all look great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And while you're probably looking at me going, you know, who's this pale skin blonde thing out there calling yourself an Aboriginal? I am a Ghana and a woman. I um, live and work in my community and have done my whole life. I was privileged enough to grow up in Ngunnawal country where I was a guest in their country growing up. So I, I am Aboriginal. I have I come from a, a long line of strong Aboriginal black women, and I have a very fiery redhead Irish mother. So it would be remiss of me not to mention my um, my connection to my Irish side as well. But um, I think, um, and firstly, I just want to say I want to be you when I grow up. So <laughs> I'm probably old enough to be your mum, but I'm, I'm a new fan. I think you're wonderful, and I think you're a great advocate. Um, I think um, the biggest thing for Aboriginal people around, and again, if I say something wrong, this is the first time I've ever seen this. I will promise that I will try and get my language around mental illness and suicide correct, and I'll do my best at work to make sure people are, are educated in the language. Um, so please forgive me. But um, yeah, being an Aboriginal woman, I think growing up the stigma of um, black men who culturally were very empowered um, and very, very strong men um, and not being allowed to recognise that they had a mental illness or being from um, a poverty stricken family or socioeconomic group where we can't afford as Aboriginal people to get a diagnosis. We can't afford to go to see, and I, and I listen to you guys and, and how that you, and you, you're really powerful around talking to a psychiatrist or, or a professional mental health um, practitioner, and Aboriginal people just can't afford it. We, and, I, and I, for the last three years, have worked out of a homeless shelter, and the amount of people that don't even have a front door to call home, how can they afford to get diagnosed in schizophrenia, in schizoaffectiveness, in bipolar, and get NDIS supports? Can they go to a medical health practitioner and get and sit down and get a bus or get a taxi or you know take their children or whatever it is they need to do to to go and get them the, the support that they need um, and to get the diagnosis and I, th and I think if you work in the, um, the mental health um, space and if you work with young children young children with um, um, possible mental health illness become adults with mental health illness and they're not diagnosed young they, they become, um, they are involved in the justice system. They become involved in, you know, they, and the justice system doesn't look at mental health if you're not diagnosed as a proper um, a condition that is, may have affected you or caused you to commit a criminal offence. So I guess, um, yeah, there's the, I could go on and on for hours, and, and Cindy has told me I have to try and be quick. But the one thing that really kind of struck with me with you guys was, um, when someone, when an Aboriginal man or an Aboriginal woman open up or, and say that they have um, a mental health um, concerns or they, they feel they have a mental health illness, quite often society doesn't allow us to. And Aboriginal people feel like we get told to get over it. Get the fuck over it. 200 years ago, Captain Cook got here. You know, and we're sick to death of hearing that because my grandfather was a war hero who wasn't even counted in 1967 before he returned home from the war as a citizen in the country that he protected Queen and country for. You know, so it wasn't stuff that happened 200 years ago. And if you're a person, you know, and whether you've, you know, subconsciously or consciously said, 
I'm not going to Aboriginal person, get over it. Happened 200 years ago, and it's like we're not allowed to own anything. We're not allowed to own having a mental illness or a trauma or intergenerational trauma. And we and 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 then when someone does, for example, Anna Woods came out and he spoke about mental health. He spoke about his own personal mental health issues. He sorry, issues is probably the wrong word. He spoke about his mental health diagnosis. He spoke about the difficulty as an Aboriginal male in this country and coming out and talking about it. And he got bullied. He got criticised in the media, in social media, for speaking about having a mental health or having a mental illness. And as, I feel like as an Aboriginal woman, we don't allow our people, and our, especially our men, to say that they've got a mental health issue. And we have to stop that as a society. We have to, if an Aboriginal person says they have a trauma, or they have intergenerational trauma, or they have a mental health diagnosis, support them in it. Don't stop them or block them from owning or being empowered by having that mental health and then reaching out for the support that they need. So, and, and I think poverty is probably the biggest thing with Aboriginal people. Like, we, you, you get told through closing the gap that you can get five free um, mental health, professional mental health support um, things a year. Five. So, you've got a mental health, mental health issue or um, mental health um, diagnosis, you've got five opportunities to get that fixed. And then that's it. So um, I, I just, I would, I, if you're in that field, if you're working in that field, have an open heart, have an open mind, and treat Aboriginal people. Um, don't think, get over it, get get rid of that. Like, please, that if I can beg of you to think of one thing, but don't ever think, oh come on, you get you get enough already. Black people already get enough. You know, if we can get away from that headspace, then I think we'll, we'll do better. Thanks so much for those important words, Deb. Um, now we've got nine minutes. So um, another question that we did have, I think I might try and join two together and hopefully that's okay, but um, we had a question regarding mental health first aid and how you guys feel that might be um, a really important addition into the workspace. But I thought what we could incorporate into that is mindfulness as well um, at work and at home. Anyone has any thoughts on that? I, that's a, a good one. I like to talk to my before going into world being full time. The last sixteen years, I've been in pet retail. So pet stock is in a family business that uh, built up with my brother and my dad. And I'd be really uh, proud if the government put legislation in to actually have a percentage of. Uh, we have one hundred and five staff in our stores. In my my experience to have one or two people in each of our outlets who have got a mental health first aid training would be, would be fantastic. Um, the uptake is slow and everyone's got first aid training. Um, I, I just think the mental health first aid training is, is vital. And um, you know, if they made it that 5% of, of your workers had to have it as a percent, it would, it, would, it, would, it would encourage and force commercial businesses to actually go and do the training and do it. Uh, but it's just vital because it's, you know, uh, health conditions are the same whether they're physical or whether they're mind health related. And um, the training and the knowledge uh, has got a long way to go before it gets to an acceptable level. Never underestimate the power of a peer workforce, peer support. If you have the knowledge to help you, a colleague or a friend, like, that is absolute power when it comes into mental health. You don't always have to go seek psychological help, you don't always have to go get psychotherapeutic support. Just asking a peer, someone who you work with alongside, and that's in a lot of workplaces, it would be great for far more organisations to have a dedicated rep who is that individual within the workforce voted by the people to fulfill a course like that, where everyone feels comfortable coming up. You'll know someone in your circles in your, that you can just rock up and like, you know that if you just open up that conversation, you know it's gonna be received well. Having dedicated individuals in the workforce um, would have a um, profound impact on breaking stigma and actually uh, supporting others with yeah, mental health. I think we work so often we come to work and we look at the people that we're supporting, our clients, our participants, and we fail to a left or right 
Oracle down, and it's really important to address the people that you work with because some of the people might not have someone to go home to. You might be their only form of support, so just have a look. Left or right, Oracle down. What I like about mindfulness is that it's very culturally inclusive because I think too often we think about um, therapy and the mental health model in a very Anglo Christian colonial. Um, male orientated way. It goes through the default systems. But mindfulness is so universal. Every culture, pretty much across the world, you will have diverse people in one room and you say mindfulness, they will all be able to talk to you about how that looks like in their life, whether it's spirituality, whether it's through meditating, whether it's just feeling the flaw on the you might talk about uh, psychologists love having me take my my shoes off. Because it's such a huge part of my African culture that he allowed, you know, so I can feel the flaw of the grass underneath and how that just, I don't know, it's linked to me, there's foundation of feel the chair under me, you know, every step of the way, it's like if you overwhelm your leader, you know, go back to mindfulness, be more present, what's going on around you. I think it's more inclusive culturally, because when we talk about mental health, too often we put people in a box, you know, we, we eliminate people's cultural beliefs or spiritual beliefs, but those are true to who they are. That, that can be harnessed in a strength-based approach rather than a deficiency model that says all the ways things are wrong with you, all the ways this is your fault or who is who has done what, rather than going, what do you have going for you that we can utilize? You know, whether it's, you know, in, in the meditation, sometimes my therapist will ask me, you know, what's the safest place for you? And I always say two things, your office right here is one of my safe places because all the walls come up. I'm not a mom, I'm not a daughter, I'm just Khadija wanting to do whatever I want to deal with. The other one is holding my baby, sniffing him. Don't go sniffing other people's babies, just your baby. But, My baby in my arm is one of the most cool up when he's quiet. Quiet things in the world. It's okay. Um, and just holding him, this it just a sense of just everything comes back to this little human and I. And I, I just love it. So mindfulness can be such a simple thing in our lives. It can be as big as we want, but I think it could be more incorporated. Rather than people going to fairy stuff, it is actually more culturally inclusive and so powerful. I think um, you really get something on the head there around culture. Yes. And it's and when you said Anglo. And so often we will think of um, using professionals out, and we won't think of like, Aboriginal professionals. We've got Nungaree healers that have been around yes. for 60,000 years that have been healing Aboriginal people prior to colonialism. Don't be afraid if you work in that field to reach out to Nungarees. You know, and, and, and within our field, within Aboriginal people, we, we don't speak mental illness is not a word. We say pick up or your spirits lift your body. So for a nunkery to address or diagnose someone, they'll say the spirit's sitting on your back, it's cracked. So look outside the Anglo medical professions and start looking at culture and start addressing um, other cultural needs that might help other cultures, and especially Aboriginal people, connect and say, it's okay. It's okay to be picker. We can help you. Thank you so much. What I'm going to do now is put you all on the spot. We have three minutes left and Nathan's going to want to wind this out to add this video to his portfolio, so we need to wind up. But what I'm hoping I can ask of you is the questions that we haven't had a chance to answer. If I send them to you, would you be able to respond um, to ones that you're drawn to? And we can include that somewhere on our website with the video, your responses that we didn't get to today. Fantastic. Big round of applause for our panel.
the new and invigorated Playford Suicide Prevention Network. This has been created for each and every one of you, and it is yours to hold on to and protect. So thank you all for coming. I'd also like to thank all of our sponsors and volunteers for their devotion and time today, and all the communities fund Skylight Mental Health, Barrels Care, Miami, Office of the Premier's Council and Suicide Prevention, Job Prospects and the City of Playford. If I've missed some, I am so sorry. And so signing off, I believe it is six o'clock. Have a great remainder of the week and good night.